Martian arrived tomorrow and said to me, well, what's it all about? I'd say, for a start, it's about something they haven't got on Mars, it's air. You take off the roof, the top of the car is the height of the nearest star. To actually drive the car is no pleasure at all. You drive along in this car and suddenly the world seems a brighter place. I think it would be true to say that MG is one of the greatest motoring accidents that ever happened. Morris Garages was the main distributor in Oxfordshire for uh, Morris cars. They were run at the time by a character called Cecil Kimber. They used to put special bodies on Morris cars for various customers and uh, these things were sold at inflated prices. And Kimber had the brilliant idea of increasing the performance just very slightly, try and make cars go slightly better, offer a little bit more for the money. And then Kimber had another idea of producing a sports special which we now refer to as old number one. And it's generally acknowledged as the first MG sports car. MG became a company in its own right towards the end of 1927. Once the identity was formed, Kimber set his eyes on producing a, a Le Mans-styled sports car. And he was able to find sufficient Morris parts available to be able to produce what is now known as the 1880. And the chief claim to fame of this car is the fact that it was the first MG to have the traditional MG radiator on with the centre spine and the badge at the top. From then on, all MGs up to the MGB uh, could trace their linearity through this radiator. However, it wasn't this big car that uh, proved the commercial success that Kimber was seeking. It was, in fact, a very much smaller car based on the Morris Minor, and it was called the MG Midget. This car is the MG M-Type Midgets. It was MG's first affordable volume production car. The MG M-Type was launched for the 1928 London Motor Show. Production of the car didn't really start until the following year, 1929. Basically, this car is a Morris Minor of its day. The chassis, the running gear, the wheels, uh, the basics of the engine even, were all Morris Minor. What he did to the car was he produced an overhead camshaft version on a very lightweight body, it's all wood, which gave quite reasonable performance for its day. I, the road testers got between 60 and 65 miles an hour on, the, on these cars, which was quite considerable for a 1920s design car. The sporting attributes of this car were its looks, which uh, embodied mainly by the uh, boat tail back, which was a very typical style of the late 1920s, which you could find on things like Amel cars, Austin 7 sports cars. It was also a two-seater car. Uh, the mere fact it was a two-seater car conjures up images of sports car. Although Kimber had originally been talking in terms of a few hundred cars being produced, the midget was being produced in thousands per annum. They produced three and a half thousand in three years. By today's standards, very, very small production indeed, but by the standards of the time, that, that was an enormous production. And do bear in mind that we're talking about sports cars here, and sports cars only. There was no touring version of an MG which was offered after 1931. It was bought as a car, an old car to run around in whilst I was rebuilding a more modern but still pre-war MG. The pre-war MG still doesn't go, but this one does. I bought it in a back street in a small town near Leeds in 1967, having spent a night in the pub for £30. When I saw the car the next day, I discovered that I'd been robbed for the £30. It was probably only worth £25. It was in a terrible, although it was a running car, it was in a terrible state. The body was all held together with bits of angle iron. Uh, there was no boat tail back on it at all. It leaked every fluid that it had. The performance was negligible. Uh, the electricity certainly didn't work. The way I look at this car is that I need pleasure from the car. 
and to get the pleasure I have to run it every year. So in the winter I treat it to something. In the early days it was a major thing like having the engine rebuilt or having the wiring redone. Now it's sort of having a bit polished maybe. But the great pleasure is running the car every year. There is no point in having a car, an old car, which sits in a showroom or sits in a garage. You've got to use it. It's so much fun. Once you have a reliable car, you feel you can go anywhere in it. In the last five years, it's been to America, it's been to Luxembourg twice, it's been to Holland, Guernsey, France. To actually drive the car is no pleasure at all. It's uncomfortable, it's slow in relative modern terms. If it rains, there's no roof, so you get wet, but it's good fun. MG, from the very start in the 30s, had, had caught on to, of course, the good badge, the logo. And that dominates their advertising and, indeed, their cars right to the present day. When you look at brochures and advertising, you get this gigantic MG badge on everything so that everyone can clearly see that. You also get sporting pedigree. So in a 1930s brochure, you will see pictures of sports car successes. The success in racing gave, gave MG the highest possible profile. There is absolutely no doubt at all that people who bought sports MGs were getting a certain amount of reflected glory from the antics of all the others who were racing the car so successfully. In the beginning, sports cars were only for the very rich. But after World War II, along came MG and the not-so-very-rich discovered it. During the Second World War, uh, many American servicemen in particular came to Britain and when they were here they fell in love with the pre-war MGs and they fell in love with the TC at, uh, when that came out and they loved the lines of the car, the fact that you could take the roof off was nothing special to Americans because they had many rooftop cars but what they liked were the, the straight angled lines of the TC the fact that you could get two people in it comfortably the fact it was very inexpensive to buy very easy to look after, cheap to run and if it went wrong, as cars did in those days, they still do now I suppose but in those days they were easy to fix at the side of the road with a spanner And even you could put the windscreen down and have little aero screens, as you see on the TC. And uh, at the time, the people who sold the MGs to the British and to the Americans, etc., they, they sold it with uh, the similarity of the uh, aeroplanes of the day. The company realised that they had a tremendous asset in MG and they could export these cars all over the world. The TC, having proved very popular, was replaced by the MGTD. The, the suspension was improved, the wheels a little bit smaller, and bumpers were even fitted front and back, which the purists at the time didn't like. And that car sold 28,000, not just to the British, but to the Americans, to Australians, to South Africans, and people who were captured by the MG, if you like, when they saw the car, when they were, um, when they were touring in, in Britain. The MG is synonymous with youth, and that's youth from 17 years old right up to 87 years old. We even have a member in her mid-80s still driving an MG BGT and loving the car. So the TC and the TD really, after the war, started all that. Without insulting MG people, I suspect that people who bought MGs, certainly early ones, took themselves rather seriously and uh, probably wore check caps and smoked pipes and thought of themselves as being part of the English tradition, rather in contrast to Triumph buyers, who I think were a little bit more glamorous and racy and up-to-date. By 1954, it was fairly obvious that the T-Series MG had had its day. The engine dated back to 1939 and no further power could be extracted from it. And furthermore, the frontal area of the car was such that it needed more power to be able to go faster. It was fairly obvious that a better shape had to be found. Racing and record-breaking was leading the way. 
MG. For 35 years, a magic name to all who love thoroughbred sports cars. A name with a tradition, but a tradition that never rests on its laurels. It took another great stride forward in 1955 at Le Mans, that unique event where quality counts for most and luck for least. Here, the public saw for the first time a new and remarkable product of the MG stable. The prototype of the car which was soon to become world famous, a race-bred car which gives both the competition driver and the normal intelligent motorist the finest value for money they have ever dreamed of. The MGA was so different from anything that MG had produced before. Going back in history, the T-Type and all its predecessors were all nice little two or four-seater little square cars. They were all very similar in shape in a way. They were high front cowled um, with the straight backs to them. And this, with its sweeping curves, is totally different. A race-bred car which gives both the competition driver and the normal intelligent motorist the finest value for money they have ever dreamed of. It's showing its faces on the Myra track, the Motor Industry Research Association in Leicestershire. Like its standard MGA brother, the twin cam combines speed with comfort. It really stopped the old-fashioned look of the MG, if you like, and brought out a certainly more sophisticated MG in terms of streamlining. Part of the pedigree of this car obviously stems from the research that went into EX181, the Utah salt flat record breaker, as was driven by Sterling Moss. And from the moment the MG Special crosses the start line, it's obvious the old records are going to be smashed by a handsome margin. The only question is, by how big a margin? One by one, the records pile up. One kilometer, 245.64 miles an hour. One mile, 245.11 miles an hour. Considering the car was so revolutionary in its time, it was quite amazing that something so new could be such a success. There was a storm of protest when it first came out because it wasn't what people were used to. I think that's probably true of anything that comes out. It's not what is considered true MG form, true MG shape. So the purists were up in arms. They didn't like it, they didn't want to buy it. The only measure of success really is in sales figures. 13,000 in the first full year of production. They then went on to build 58,000 1500s and 31,000 MGA 1600s. And in total, with a smattering of twin cams, deluxes, and all the MGAs put together, they built this staggering total of 101,081. And of course, a lot of them went overseas. The states were mad keen on them. A lot went uh, straight away. They went from the factory straight to California. And of course, a lot have come back from California since, including my car, which sits behind me now. This is a California re-import. The MGA is a delight to drive. It's not quick. It doesn't have 0 to 60 in 0 0.x seconds, but it's pure pleasure. I tend to crunch it, the gears happily between first and second, but uh, it's a very nice car to drive. And it's like having a modern car in a classic body. The MG came from a time when Britain was great, and still is, of course, but it represents everything that's nice about Britain. You stop at traffic lights and the lorry driver leans out of his cab and you're expecting the bit of smart and the chat up line and all you get is what year is the car and has it got disc or drum brakes and always dad had one. It's definitely a friendly, happy car. There's something about a girl in a sports car, but it, it's it's for my pleasure, actually, it does me good. It's my, my ego trip, if you like. It doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. But you do get admiring glances. I think it's probably for the car, certainly not for me, perhaps for the dog. But people do wave, and it's a happier day when you take the MG out. Often, this is how the octagon spirit makes itself felt on this otherwise humdrum planet. MGB, latest of the breed, latest example of the octagon spirit. MGB, a high performance vehicle. The MGB was launched in 1962 and it was very well received by the motoring press and the, the public alike. It followed on from the MGA. Uh, the MGB differed from the A in as much as it was uh, of monocoque construction 
Uh, that means the, uh, the strength was actually in the, the complete body pressing, whereas the MGA was built on a solid chassis. The whole uh, idea behind the car was to make it affordable. MGs always had been affordable right from the word go. And uh, for the first time they were going to go into high, high volume, low cost production. Well, the GT followed on in 1965, and that was really uh, just giving another dimension to the MGB. Uh, with the solid roof, more security, you could carry more things inside the car because you had the opening tailgate. Ideal shopping car for the ladies. Today's MGB has rack and pinion steering, race season suspension, four-speed gearbox and hefty 1798cc engine. A few reasons why the MGB is the most popular MG ever built. MG, the sports car America loved first. The MGB GT V8 was introduced in 73 by British Leyland. Uh, the wrong time really, it was right in the middle of the fuel crisis in, uh, in the Middle East and uh, petrol was astronomical. People thought that the big three and a half litre engine was going to guzzle the fuel, which was a bit of a myth really. Uh, driven sedately, you could get 28 to the gallon. Drive it hard and it would drop down to uh, low 20s. But it was a really stunning performer. 0 to 60 in 7.2 seconds was uh, really quick for early 70s cars. Well, I have to enthuse about it. I've owned it virtually from new. I've done about 200,000 miles odd in it, used every day. I think it's a great car, very underrated. Uh, people say, uh, you know, does it handle? Yes, it's fine, it's down to the driver. In the 70s, under British Leyland, MG began to lose their way. Their brochures and their advertising has no logo and no reference to the past. It tries to be aggressively modern. It takes up the theme of you can do it in an MGB with all the sexual overtones of that. And their brochures and their presentations showed nothing of the pedigree and everything of the girl in the car. All this was really the end of MG, certainly in that phase. And once they'd lost sight of their history, of their logo, of their traditions, they were in fact doomed to failure because they were, nobody was actually buying the new image they presented. And in fact, I think MG in that period, both their advertising and perhaps their cars became a bit of a laughing stock. Hands are marvelous things. They can put together something as rugged and reliable as a front disc brake or as precise as a carburetor. They can assemble a four-speed all synchro mesh gearbox or guide a race-proven engine into an all-steel monocoque body. There are over a thousand pairs of hands at Abingdon, England. Together, they build the MGB. The rubber bumpered MGB was uh, introduced in 75, and that was to comply with the American regulations, safety regulations. Uh, it was very important for the uh, MG, or British Leyland as it was then, to uh, export these cars, bring dollars into the UK. The uh, bumpers were set at a very high ride height to comply with ramming up the rear of American cars. There was a whole host of things that affected the performance because they had to have uh, emission control systems. Now this is the MG RV8 which was introduced in 1992. This car is the last of the MGB line. A limited run car of 2,000 vehicles. It was introduced to celebrate 30 years of the MGB. Very uh, expensive car. The uh, affordable MG went out the window with this one. It's £26,000, but very luxuriously appointed. Very good performer. 3.9 litre fuel injected V8 engine, giving stunning performance. 0 to 60 in about five and a half seconds, something of that order. A very quick car. Well, I think the, the MGB is the epitome of the British sports car. Uh, it was exported worldwide and anybody you talk to, you know, they recognise an MGB. They, they, it's just got that attraction about it. It's uh, one of the few cars that was in continuous production for 18 years, which is unheard of really in uh, motor industry terms. And uh, 30 years on, it's a timeless design. Timeless design. It hasn't aged at all. For me personally, the car is just bags of character. The, the MGB, Originally, it didn't set the world alight with performance, but uh, people still drive them today. It'll keep up with most of the modern traffic on the road. Uh, it's a great motorway performer. You know, you can cruise along at 75 quite happily. And uh, it doesn't cost an arm and leg to run. 
Before the company was known as British Leyland, the company was BMC, British Motor Corporation. And it didn't just involve MG, it involved other marks, and in particular Triumph. And there was quite a lot of bitterness and rivalry between the Triumph and the MG camps. And unfortunately, the Triumph people got the money, the Triumph people got the investment, and the Triumph people got the designs of the new cars. But in 1979, a tragedy befell MG. MG Abingdon factory employees learnt that uh, Sir Michael Edwards had announced that the MG factory was due to close, and that was known as Black Monday. So they closed the factory. But British Leyland got a shock. They didn't realise just how much love there was and affection, not just in Britain, not just with enthusiasts, but with everybody all over the world. And they realised, with, with all this furor, that they had a tremendous asset in the Mark MG. Now, they didn't have the money then to develop a new sports car. So what they did was they brought out an MG-badged version of the Metro, the Maestro and the Montego. Now, some of the purists went absolutely berserk. You can't put an MG badge on this. This is just a bog-standard family car. But they said, no, wait and see, because this car is a very fast, very good performance car, and it's worthy of the MG badge. And enthusiasts liked the car, and they said, yes, we can understand what you're doing. But what we really want is the introduction of an MG high-volume, low-cost sports car. And we badgered British Leyland to do this. And behind the scenes, they worked on the car, they worked on the uh, MGF, and in March 1995, the MGF was launched at Geneva, and it stole the show. Other cars were launched, even the Bentley Azure was there, but the MGF stole the show. Unlike robot-built cars, which are stamped out in their thousands and just sold, they have no character, no personality. The MGs, for many, many years, were hand-built, and what people are doing is they're rejecting the modern press stampings and they're going for cars with character. And the first year's production has already been sold. The Jap Japanese, who are potty about MG and British sports cars, have ordered a, a whole year's production, which they'll have to wait for. Rover Group know the strength of the MG mark and we're really looking forward to the next generation, a new generation of MGs. In my opinion, the MGF is an excellent two-seater sports car. It fits into the mould of the previous models such as the MGB and earlier cars and it's the sort of car which Cecil Kimball would have been proud to produce himself. MGs are just pure fun. They can appeal to every walk of life. You can buy an MG for a few hundred pounds, or you can spend thousands of pounds on it. They don't have this snobbish elitism attached to them like perhaps some of the bigger cars do, the Jaguars, the Al Alphas, the Austin Healys, the Aston Martins. You drive along in this car and suddenly the world seems a brighter place. People smile at you, and you smile at them, they wave to you. There's no jealousy attached to them. It's definitely a British car and people love it, literally, they just love MGs.